Good evening. I'll be presenting you the orbitozygomatic approaches to the middle fossa and the cavernous sinus. I'll start with thanking to North American Skullbase Society and the President Golfinos and the co-directors of this course, Drs. Rasake and Mehta. I'll have 15 minutes. I'll try to be brief and I have no disclosures. This is our lovely city, Madison, in Wisconsin. So just brief historical perspective about the orbitozygomatic approach is first uh, Yashar Gidan Fox uh, described ternal craniotomy and adding the orbital osteotomy. Then Jane called this approach supraorbital craniotomy and modified an orbitozygomatic craniotomy by Pellerin and Hokuba in 1986. And LMFT further uh, modified this approach and called it supraorbital channel approach. And Della shows uh, contribution and finally the barrel clinic description and very detailed surgical anatomy of this approach in 1998. What are the indications? A neoplastic and vascular lesions involving the anterior cranial fossa, medial cranial fossa, paracellular region, in particular cavernous sinus, interpedicular cistern, and you can reach all the way upper part of the clivus. Advantages, it minimizes the retraction or eliminates the retraction, improve multi-angle trajectory and shallower depth of the field, wider angle of exposure to lesions involving the cavernous sinus and upper clivus. Disadvantages, there's potentially cosmetic problems, risk of pulsatile and ophthalmos, bone reabsorption and zygomatic separation. Position and skin incision, I like to rotate the head to opposite side 20 to 40 degree, depends on the location of the lesion you are attacking. And to avoid the frontal lobe covering the surgical field, you need to bring the malar eminences, the highest point in your surgical field. And that requires a slight extension of the head. Incision, frontotemporal incision, starting half centimeter anterior to the tragus over the zygomatic arch. We don't recommend going more than the one centimeter below the level of zygoma because facial nerve tibics can travel at this level. We recommend the preserving the posterior branch of the STA at least during the exposure for the scalp healing and also it, you need to use the STA for any vascular reconstruction. This video summarizes the scalp flap elevation. We like to elevate the scalp flap all the way up to almost two finger breadth from anterior angle of the supraorbital bar. So that's approximately two to two and a half centimeter or two finger breadth. And when you start seeing the subgallial fat pad, which is the first fat layer, you should stop with the scalp flap elevation because you don't want to go too deep. If you go beyond this point, you can injure the tweaks of the facial nerve. And then we carry on with the subfacial dissection to elevate the uh, temporalis muscle, temporalis fascia. This can be done in the interfacial fashion or subfacial fashion. I'll prefer doing the subfacial fashion, and I'm going to show you guys this example. First, we elevate the uh, pericranium, which can be used as a free flap or pedicle flap to reconstruct the anterior cranial fossa or in case of frontal sinuses open, uh, reconstruct the frontal sinus. Then leaving the muscle cuff along the superior temple line and elevating the temporalis fascia in a subfacial fashion all the way to the zygoma and supraorbital bar. And this is the anatomical dissections from our lab demonstrating the uh, facial nerve tweaks traveling in the subgallial fat layer. We are staying below the deep uh, layer of the temporalis fascia. There are two layers, superficial and the deep. We like to see this fat when you do the, this dissection. And again, there's not one or two branches, multiple tweaks coming from the zygomatic branch or from the temple branch of the facial nerve. And these branches, these tweaks are at risk when elevating this flap. This facial nerve, usually there are three branches coming at this level. Anterior branch that goes to the orbicularis oculi muscle, middle branches go to the frontalis muscle, and the posterior branches innervate the superior anterior auricularis and tragus muscles. Muscle dissection, elevation of the flap, uh, we see we use the periostal elevator uh, coming from the zygomatic root, then elevating the periorbita away from the uh, orbital roof, final elevation of the temporalis muscle in subperiostal plane to preserve the vascularity and the nerve innervation of the facial nerve, which will reduce the atrophy of the temporalis muscle. The craniotomy and the number of burr holes all are optional. If you need more anterior cranial fossa exposure, you can come more. If you need more temporal middle fossa exposure, you need to be more posterior. You tailor your craniotomy according to your needs for the exposure. And again, number of the burr holes are optional. Depends on the patient's age, adherence of the dura, etc. 
this again showing the uh, final product. For example, in this one, we need more anterior post exposure. You can come. If no need for that, you can go more posterior and minimize the anterior cranial fossa. And this is the final exposure of the zygomatic bone from root of the zygoma, malar eminence, frontozygomatic suture, supraorbital bar, and frontal region, temporal region. This is the cut we don't recommend. You need to be very careful when you are making the cut in the uh, root of the zygoma. You don't want to go to the temporal mandibular joint or external ear canal. So you avoid this kind of cut. Instead, you make point your reciprocating so away from the external ear canal or temporal mandibular joint. And you make two cuts, one above, one below. So it's kind of obtuse angle and it reconstructs better. And the other cuts in the malar eminence and then in the supraorbital bar, again, you want to use all your exposure instead of holding the reciprocating so like this, you should hold like that to get all exposure you needed. Osteotomy cuts, again, uh, summary slide demonstrating the uh, osteotomy cuts, cut at the root of zygoma, malar eminence, roof of orbit, and the supraorbital bar. Again, this is the showing the cuts from the other view, two-piece OZ, uh, which I like to do. You can do one piece, but I think two pieces much simpler and faster. And this is the show you do the cuts along the root of zygoma again, holding the reciprocating saw that, and the malar eminence here, and the supraorbital bar, and the orbital roof, connecting these cuts through the inferior orbital fissure. And you can feel the inferior orbital fissure easily in cadaver dissections or in the, in the patient. And this is the modified OZ. We are not doing full OZ in this time and showing the one cut in the supraorbital bar, another cut, horizontal cut in the orbital roof, and another cut lateral to the frontozygomatic suture, which is here, and connecting to the inferior orbital fissure. This is the modified one, and this is most commonly used one, full OZ you rarely need nowadays. And this is the final view showing the modified OZ done and the exposure in the anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, elevation of the muscles and preservation of the periorbital and lacrimal glands can be seen here. And this is the case before osteotomy and after osteotomy. The amount of exposure you gain and the subarachnoid hemorrhage case minimizes the retraction if you perform uh, this much orbitotomy. And this is the case example again, another ruptured aneurysm case. We are kind of rushing in this case, ACOM aneurysm and elevating the skull flap, doing the subfacial dissection, elevating the temporalis muscle in the subprestal plane. And after the burr holes, we perform the craniotomy. And this is the craniotomy, take up sutures, first cut in the orbital bar second cut in the orbital roof, and another cut in the zygomatic bone, lateral to the frontozygomatic suture, final osteotomizing, and getting the uh, orbit out, and then rangering the remaining part of the, uh, uh, remaining part of the orbital wall. And this is the frontal sciences open. We're going to accentuate that too. When you do the OZ, if you want to expose the coronary sinus, you need to do anterocolinoidectomy. My preference is extradural anterocolinoidectomy. You have to have the full understanding of the bony and vascular and nervous anatomy in this region, showing the anterocolinoid process, optic roof, optic canal, and the optic strut, piece of the bone between superorbital fissure and optic canal. What are the advantages? It increases the visualization, early decompression and mobilization of the optic nerve, and and improves the surgical exposure of the intracellular optic canal. Exodural clinidectomy, I'll prefer most of the time doing the exodural clinidectomy, which allows complete removal of the anterior clinid process without or with minimal brain retraction, and dura acts as a natural barrier and protects the brain. You need to be aware of the pneumatization of the anterior clinoid process and also erosion of the anterior clinoid process by aneurysms. If there's an aneurysm in that paraclinoidal region, you need to be aware and study preoperatively all these much better fashion than being unprepared during the surgery. Anatomy is so important. Oculomotor nerve is closely related to the tip of the uh, clinoid. This is the, again, dissections from our lab showing the anatomical relationship of the anterior clinoid process with the surrounding neurovascular structures.
this is the dural ring, proximal dural ring, and this is the cadaveric dissection, how you perform the extradural dissection, cutting the mening orbital band, stage sutures, retraction sutures on the frontal and temporal dura, and elevating towards the superior orbital fissure after cutting the mening orbital band, and this will expose entire clinoid optic canal optic roof is going to be somewhere here and entire clinoid that cone shaped bone is exposed now we can drill that and this is the another example a cadaveric dissection after clinoidectomy performed cutting the distal drill ring and you'll see ophthalmic artery right here clinoidal segment of the carotid is here and cavernous sinus is going to be here and this is another movie demonstrating the uh, cavernous sinus extradural dissection you see the oclomotor nerve here, fourth nerve, V1, V2, V3, middle meningeal. This is just for demonstration purposes. The brain is removed in this cadaveric spacement. You see oclomotor nerve entering the cavernous sinus, GSPN coming from genital ganglion, and middle meningeal artery, V3 branch of the trigeminal nerve. And this is the petrous apex rhomboid or so called Kawase uh, triangle. Uh, V3, V2, V1, fourth nerve, oclomotor nerve, and we just got the glimpse of the super petrosal sinus here. If you do OZ, that gives you the direct access to this region, cavernous sinus, posterior cavernous sinus, meckles cave, and the middle fossa. And further dissection brings the super petrosal sinus to view more, fourth nerve, V1, and you all have these paracellular uh, triangles exposed. And again, here we are going back to genital ganglion. GSPN, middle meningeal, and the uh, petrous carotid is going to be somewhere here. A couple of case examples when I utilize the OZ or modified OZ, this is a, a large biopsy proven chondrosarcoma. One side of the carotid occluded by the tumor, patients are symptomatic but with good collaterals. And in this case, I prefer to do OZ due to the size of the tumor to allow me to do wider dissection without significant brain retraction. Orbitotomy is done, state sutures, putting in the temporal dura and extra dural elevation of the dura propria from the lateral uh, wall of the cavernous sinus. Sectioning the mening orbital band here, you can see, and with the sharp cutting instruments, uh, and then this, this will expose the anterior clinoid process, and you'll see the superorbital fissure exposed, and carry on the dissection from anterior clinoid all the way laterally and the three and four will be here v1 v2 v3 and drilling the anterior clinoid process and performing the optic unroofing will allow you to further strip the dura towards the gasserian ganglion and you have to cut the middle meningeal eventually also so the anterior clinoid to be done now we are stripping the dura more and see the expanded region here is the v2 v3 v1 middle meningeal going to the foramen spinosum uh, gspn is already isolated and verified with the facial nerve stimulator stimulating the uh, genital ganglion we got the glimpse of the tumor here and now we're gonna drill the bone over the foramen ovale foramen rotundum and foramen spinosum section the middle meningeal and further stripping the dura and eventually getting to the tumor. So uh, see what further is very expanded uh, uh, cavernous sinus wall and the Meckles cave region. And you'll eventually go between the trigeminal nerves, V2 and V3 first, and then V1 and the fourth nerve, and then dissect all these and then remove this uh, chondrosarcoma. This is the post-op imaging showing the gross total resection with good outcomes. This is another chondrosarcoma case. Uh, we utilize this approach to the middle fossa and posterior cavernous sinus. We, this is the anatomical dissections showing the superior petrosal sinus here, GSPN, V3, V2, V1. And this is the case example. See the, again, performing the same thing anterior clinoidectomy, exposing the clinoidal ICA, and eventually exposing the petrous ICA, V3, tethering by the foramen uh, spinosum middle meningeal artery, uh, anatomical dissection demonstrating the neurovascular relations in this region. Isolating everything, getting to do so GSPN. Soon we're going to drill the remaining part of the petrous apex, 
exposed to petroscarotid and work between and then removed with the chondrosarcoma. And this is the amount of the bone removed, gross total resection after proton beam. And this is the case I used full OZ years ago. And nowadays I will probably do only uh, cranial orbital uh, modified OZ. And this gives you direct access to the interpedicular system and much better control of the uh, basilar artery and its branches and gross total resection achieved in this case. Ruptured basilar tip aneurysm is perfect for cranial orbital or full OZ. In this case, I did the full OZ. It was a long time ago, but nowadays I will just do either cranial orbital or just anterior clinoidectomy in this ruptured uh, basilar tip aneurysm. And this is the orbital hemangiopericytoma case, perfect for the cranial orbital approach. You don't even see the brain. You just stay over the dura, open the orbital roof, and remove the tumor. In conclusion, orbital zygomatic approach provides access to the anterior and middle cranial fossa as well as the deep paracellular and cavernous sinus regions. Increased bone removal obviates the need for vigorous brain retraction and offers an improved multi-angle trajectory and shallower operative field. Modifications to the orbital zygomatic approach provide alternatives that can be tailored to particular lesions, enabling the surgeon to use the best technique in the individual case rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. In order to learn this approach, you need to go to the lab, perform, dissect, and then you'll have better understanding when you go to the OR for residence fellows and the young faculty. I'll stop here. Thank you for your time and your attention.